Sunday, April 13th, 1981, in a bank of Chicago, the staff opened the bank main safe, not suspecting anything since everything looked the same as always and nothing was out of the ordinary. After a while, a lady came to the bank wanting to use her bank safe. She went with the mentioned staff in the safe room to open her safe deposit box since it needs two keys to open. One is the costumers and the other is the bank's. But to their surprise, when they tried to insert the keys, the lock fell off because it was broken, as well as 74 others in that safe room with all its content vanished. Without any sign of breaking in, no holes in the wall or tunnels in the floor, and the main room door was completely intact. All of this was hard to believe since usually when robberies happen, it leaves the bank in a state of chaos, which begged the question why this was not the case in this robbery. Why, whoever it is that stole the bank made sure to leave everything seemingly normal. And how did they get in the first place? All these questions will be answered today while we closely inspect one of the most interesting and unique robberies of all time. Today's story happened in the village of Barrington in Chicago. In the 80s, this village had one bank only, and it was a branch of the First National Bank, which belonged to the government. At that time, banks used a security system that relied on timers that worked like this. The bank would be open from 9 to 5, and between 5 and the next day's 9, there is 16 hours, so the bank staff would set the timer to keep the bank door shut for 16 hours. In this 16 hours, there will be nothing that can open that door not a key, nor a passcode, or a secret button, until the 16 hours passes and the timer will automatically unlock the door. Of course, the staff would need to insert a serial number to actually open the door after the 16 hours, but even that was pointless in the 16 hours of lockdown since it doesn't even register the input at that period, with the only exception being the weekend when the bank works only for half a day on Saturday, so at that time, the timer was set to be shut from the end of Saturday's shift until the next Monday's 9 a.m., which is what happened on Saturday, April 11th, 1981, just for the staff the next Monday to find that everything was gone from the safe deposit boxes. Not a single dollar, gold ingot, or a piece of jewelry was speared. It's important to mention that the other sections of the bank were operating normally at that day until that first deposit box lady came. Only then is when they found out that the safe deposit boxes room was robbed, and only it. Of course, what happened next is that the staff called 911 for the police to come and instantly start the investigations. And since the bank was owned by the government, the FBI were present at the crime scene as well. The detectives estimated that the stolen goods was valued to $1 million. Keep in mind that this happened in the 80s, so if we were to consider the inflation, that money will be equivalent today to $3,500,000, which is a huge amount of money to be stolen from a government bank. The crime scene was so confusing to the investigators as the first question that they needed to answer was, how did the thief break in? Being the first step that they needed to figure out had put them in an awkward place, because as long as they can't know that, they were stuck with no way to progress the investigations. It was clear that whatever was the way the robber got in with it was unorthodox. No holes, no tunnels, no broken door. It's like if they spawned inside the room, stole the good, and left the exact same way. There was more to it as the investigators found some very odd items when searching the room deeply, including an old-school alarm watch, some tools that were used to carefully break the locks of the 75 stolen boxes, such as hammers and pinches, and the oddest of them all was a puddle of piss. And since in the 80s the DNA analysis wasn't discovered yet, that puddle wasn't serving any purpose to the FBI other than an insult left by the thieves. The detectives went above and beyond to try and find out even the smallest of evidence that could help, even just a hint on how the thieves broke in, but it was no use. The locale news used the term perfect crime, when reporting about the incident, which was like the salt in the wound to the FBI's dignity, and what later will be adding insult to injury, is when they would find out that this robbery was done by only one guy who was a simple hairdresser.
William was a serial thief. He had already done multiple robberies, but this exact one stood up because it was the biggest he had ever done. Little that he knew it would be last his last one, although being a hairdresser for women back then was a very profitable job. But Smarto couldn't help but ask for a bigger challenge. He did the executions mostly by himself. However, from time to time he would get some assistance from his brother Vincent. The way it goes for them was that they would pick a somewhat high-income area and strike the bank of it to maximise the bounty, and the first national bank was fitting for their criteria. The brothers would go there together as customers who want to rent a safe deposit box with fake identities, of course, and with their goal being befriending the lady responsible for managing the safe deposit box section meaning that she is the one who registers the boxes under the names of customers, opens the door every day, and accompany people in there to open their boxes with them, since she is also the one charged with the bank keys for the boxes. Getting close to this lady was the task for William, since between the two brothers he was the one with sweet talk. He knew how to be funny and charming, and people would find him easy to get along with. Meanwhile, Vincent was the one who would take notes on everything else, how tight is the security, staff's patterns, who is responsible on what, and where do they store the keys and security items, when do each one usually takes a break, and so on. He would build a complete profile, including every observable detail possible on the target, but regardless of all that their main focus was exploiting the employee's weak points rather than the technical weak points, meaning that if, let's say, there was an entrance to the bank which would be easy to break, but the key holder to it is easily persuaded. They would prioritize manipulating the key holder to get the key rather than trying to break the entrance. This is a method commonly used by thieves and hackers called social engineering. After befriending the lady, the brothers would go to the bank together. And as the protocol goes, the lady would check their names and boxes they own, accompany them inside to open the bank key lock. And she would usually give the customers privacy by staying just out the room. But since those are the Smarto brothers whom she think are her friends, she'd be chit-chatting with one of them while the other, who is supposedly using the, their safe box, is actually examining everything he can about the other boxes and the room from the inside. The main thing William got from this is that the lady, like with every other customer, would check their information just when entering the room. But when they would leave, there is no examinations. They don't sign anything or register anything. The next issue William had is how to get his tools inside the room. The answer was simple. He would just put them in his box since the lady would be busy talking to his brother and no one checks what they want to store in their box anyways. And so he did. Of course, he didn't deposit all the tools at once, but rather one by one or two at times if it was something relatively small. The other issue he had is that he would eventually ran out of space before depositing all his tools since some of them were way too big, even if the box was still empty. He came up with an excuse as he told the bank staff that he was a paintings merchant, though that would only allow him to take bigger bags in the bank without drawing any suspicions, but he still had the lack of space issue. While further examining the room, he noticed that the room roof was like the office's roof, made out of plates that hided an empty space above it. And there is where he would put all of his paintings bag, that includes, of course, all the heavy tools and flashlights, enough food and water for two days. Other issue was that the safe room had a voice sensory alarm system that was meant to detect anyone who is planning on breaking in, meaning if someone would try to dig a tunnel or a hole in the floor or walls of the room, the alarm will go on and police would arrive. Of course, you would think that this should not be a problem to William, since he does not plan on digging anything, but don't forget that he would still need to break the locks on every box, and that would have certainly made enough noise for the alarm to go on. Luckily for him, the alarm system was primitive, and William had enough experience with electronics that he was able to disable it. All he had to do was to carefully unplug the he sensitivity mic, and that's it, that whole alarming system was useless. But William was also experienced enough in robberies to know that that can't be the only alarm system in the room. Fearing that there might be some other hidden detectors, William would come up with a brilliant idea. He took an alarm watch, an old school one of course, those ones with a bell that can make enough noise to wake up everyone in the house. He took it inside the room, set it to ring in midnight, 
and hid it up in the roof, and that night he would wait outside the bank and watch, as he suspected after midnight by a little bit, the cops would arrive and check on the bank if everything is normal. Viewing that everything was intact, they thought that it was just a fake alarm triggered by some unbalanced item that fell inside and made some noise or that it was just some alarm system malfunction, as these were fairly common events back then. The next week, William and Vincent would go every day, and Vincent will keep the lady busy while William searched the room and disabled every alarm system he found, and not leave any trace. Once he couldn't find any more alarm systems, he did the same test again using the alarm watch, and this time the cops didn't show up, meaning that he succeeded in dismantling the whole room's noise alarm system, and he could make as much holes in the boxes as he want to without any worries. Now comes the hardest part ever. How will he get inside the room? Saturday, April 11th, 1981. The Smarto brothers go to the bank as usual, and the lady checks their info as usual, accompanies William inside the room to unlock his box, and leaves to give him some privacy, and to have some talk with Vincent, whom at this point got comfortable enough with. And they started even flirting at times. She didn't even notice when William left this time. Actually, no one did. If anyone paid attention at all, it would have looked to them like it vanished from the room, but since there were no examinations on people when they leave, no one did. How? You might ask, well, the safe room had a design flaw. Design flaw. You see, at the corner where the boxes meet, there was a tight space left empty, enough space for William to slide in and stand there with no one able to spot him from any angle. Since it was Saturday, the working shift was over early. The lady closed the safe room door set the timer for the next Monday, and left, not suspecting a single thing. Once the lights inside the bank went off and everything became quiet, William started to move, first setting up his tools and lighting up the flashlights so he could see what he was doing. Then he initiated by hammering a screw that was the same radius of the locks on the boxes. The reason for that is that he wanted it to be as clean and smooth of perforate as possible, so that when the staff will come back on Monday, they wouldn't suspect anything until they try to open a box if any customer came that day, since Vincent's analysis told them that the bank's deposit section does not get frequent customers, and at days in a row, he and his brother would be the only customers that day. The perforation was a very exhausting task for William, since he had to do it tens of times, one forty-eight times exactly, because every box had two locks and each hit had to be precise and carry just enough force push break the lock inside. Add to it the darkness and quiet of the place and the heat, since there was no way for the air to circulate freely in and out the room, but William was not on a rush since he had more thirty hours to finish. So he took multiple breaks, ate and drink water, and even took some naps. The funny thing is the FBI found out lately that during his time inside the safe room, William decided to become Robin Hood and suddenly had the idea to take from the rich and give to the poor because people would store also their most important papers in the bank. He was able to know he was in depth, who had a lot of money and who needed more, so out of boredom and loneliness, and maybe he got a little bit high from how much it stinks inside there. William started redistributing the wealth on people. He'd take some money from boxes that had a lot of it and put inside those with the papers of depth or just small sums of money. I personally think that maybe he did it to confuse the detectives and maybe make them think that somebody did this just to cover up for the real goal, which would be moving money from other people's boxes to his... Anyways, after finishing William cleaned the room and made sure to not leave anything on the floor, his tools were put back up on the roof and Triple checked all the locks if they looked fine, he put them back in a way that unless someone tried to open them, they look exactly how they're supposed to be. After that, he jumped back in his hiding corner with the bag of the stolen goods and waited there. The morning of Monday, April 13th, 1981, the bank opened, as usual, everyone was in their places, and the keys lady came and opened the room to see that nothing was unusual, not paying attention to the small mirror peeking at her from the corner. 
It was William who brought that small mirror to use it so he can watch the movements inside and outside the room door. Once she left, and no one was waiting just in front of the door, William jumped out the corner with his bag, and he also was wearing a repair worker's uniform. The reason was that he knew that the bank had some maintenance going on, so he wore it to blend in, and for no one to notice him or wonder why he is wandering around the bank, just outside the front entrance of the bank, Vincent was waiting in a car to pick William up. The wild thing is the bounty he stole was much more than he could carry at one go, so what he did is he simply took half of it to the car and went back inside the bank to the safe room, took the other bag and went out like it's nobody's business. William indeed had more guts than he had brain for him to pull such a wild move. There is no doubt that this was one of the most impressive yet deranged robberies in history to this day. The FBI agents searched and examined every inch of the room for a single print, yet they found none. Yet the thing to them that didn't make sense the most at that time was the alarm watch. Why is it there? What was it used for? How can an alarm watch be used to rob a bank? All of these questions were driving them nuts. Viewing that there were no signs of breaching in the room from outside, and the alarm was not triggered anyway, they didn't think of checking it at first, but only when they hit the absolute dead end that they started desperately looking for any lead anywhere. It's only then when they noticed that the alarm didn't go on, not because it was not triggered, but because it was disabled slowly. But surely they figured out the purpose of the alarm watch. Finally, they were getting somewhere on this bizarre case. The only thing that was clear from the beginning to them is that whoever executed this robbery was planning it for long, and he planned very efficiently. So the chances that he might have rented a deposit box himself were very high, and so the FBI started examining the register of box owners for any suspect, they were able to check everyone on the list for at least being a real person aside from two names which were the Smarto brothers' fake identities. Even they were able to get very detailed description for the suspects by the bank staff, especially the keys lady. But it was not enough to get them anywhere, and thus the case remained in state of opened case meaning not concluded yet, for over a year. After that year, another incident happened in a different town in Chicago at a different bank. One of the customers was using the bank's toilet and a roof plate fell on him, gazing at the roof in confusion. The man sensed some movement up above inside the space above the roof plates. He informed the bank's janitor who brought a ladder and a flashlight and climbed to the spot to investigate what's going on, to his surprise, he saw a leg moving in there, so he got scared and pretended that he did not see anything, and closed the roof and called the police immediately. The cops arrived and ordered the man inside to descend, whom they later found out that his name is William Smarto, and he was hiding in the toilet roof because it was connected to the safe room's roof. I honestly don't know what was up with old Banks' designs, You'd normally think that a place where people store their most valuable materials would have as few design flaws as possible. Anyway, they also found that he had some tools hidden up there with him. Some very familiar set of tools. The FBI decided there was no way this William guy was just a normal hairdresser, so they initiated a deep dive into William's history. They didn't find anything specifically suspicious, but during this investigation, they also checked all the robberies that happened in the areas where he was at, and they managed to see a pattern. The sellout was a report about an attempt that happened in a different area in Chicago, where it said that the janitor that day met a strange man in worker's uniform drilling a hole in the safe room's wall. The janitor tried to question him, but the worker dismissed his questioning and asked him to clean up after he is done. That display of raw confidence was enough to extinguish the janitor's suspicion. He thought that the guy was a real worker and was just doing his job. Of course, William aborted the operation immediately after the janitor left, since even though he was able to deceive him, that interaction in it of itself was too much unwanted attention by his standard. So we can see that William was not just some lucky, reckless robber, but he was a true professional. But he also was an adrenaline junkie, Later on, after he was arrested and questioned, they asked him why he carried on his robberies, even though he already had accumulated huge sums of money from all his previous ones. His answer was simple. He said, I love it when I face a dangerous challenge. 
Going back to the bank where the janitor spotted him, the FBI went back there and investigated further, and they found an alarm watch hidden there. They also brought the janitor to confirm the identity of the worker, a.k.a. William, and he confirmed to them that this was the exact same guy he saw that day. So now William was convicted with two cases of attempting a robbery, but the FBI was not done with him yet. They also added to his file the April 13, 1981 case because they obviously saw that the three robberies were planned in the exact same way, so we can say that William's cleverness has backfired. He did his operations in such a unique way, it becomes easy to recognize them among other robberies, of course. With the lack of solid evidence on the April 13, 1981 case, the FBI couldn't do much about it especially since William kept denying that case to be his doing, although the judge announced him guilty and charged him with 20 years of prison, but the catch was that the judge told him that he is ready to lower his verdict if William was willing to give back everything he stole. William, hearing this, finally decided to admit to his crimes and give back everything he stole. All we know is that he was hiding it underwater somewhere in a port since when his lawyer brought the case to the courtroom. It was still wet, and stunk of fish smells. Inside the bags, the FBI found most of the things William stole, so the judge kept his word and lowered the verdict from 20 years to 8 years, but with a catch which was that William had to show the FBI how he did his robberies step by step and to take them through his thoughts process on every bit of plan he was setting. After that, William was the reason the security standards of banks were revolutionized and so many changes were done. Banks were completely rebuilt to prevent someone else like William from pilling out another perfect crime.